Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hi, Lolita. Good morning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, good morning, Chilva. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Vasker. Hi, Alexi. Thanks for joining. Thank you. <laughs> Very happy to have you guys today. Very um, excited too. Thanks for having us. Totally, totally. All right, let's get started. Hi, Matt. Good morning. Thank you for having us here. Ah, uh, good to see you, Vasker. <laughs> So I think that uh, let's wait for a couple of minutes. I did, you know, go and kind of do, do another broadcast of folks joining in for uh, this school session. Really looking forward to your talks today on um, some of the cool contributions you guys have been making to open telemetry. And, um, you know, uh, I think in the meantime, Matt, maybe um, we can run through our... Our, our regular reminders for the CSC and any other notification. Yeah, love it. That matters, I think. Matter you. Is your mic working? <laughs> It is now. Sorry, okay. I'm on a very bad connection. I'm unexpectedly traveling. <laughs> oh, no uh, worries, no worries. Ohio today. <laughs> but um, uh, I have a first announcement. It's just more administrative. Um, there should be a new invite going out once the service desk ticket um, bubbles its way through the workflow, but we have a new meeting doc location. I know, super interesting. Um, uh, this one is hosted by the CNCF now that they have Google Drives for the tags before it was hosted by uh, a CNCF member company that I used to work for. Uh, so I put that link in chat. Oh, so it's the, finally, finally moved? That's awesome. It's moved now, uh, and the old document is still live, but has a link at the top of it saying, this is old, don't use it, and here's the new link. But um, uh, Okay, so yeah. the calendar invite has the older one or the newer one? The calendar, right, st the calendar invite still has the older one, and unfortunately, the way Google Calendar invites work, anyone who doesn't accept the new invite still has the old one. This happens uh, one before. Okay, years I'm ago. wondering so which one when I a new invite goes out, Yeah, a new invite. So we'll make a service test ticket. They make a new calendar invite that goes out yeah. to the list, and then everyone that accepts it will get the updated link. But eventually, the old meeting notes doc will stop being hosted, I would imagine. But yeah, left yeah. It now as a favor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good because I must have updated the the old doc. I yeah, I'll put the abstracts and titles for the talks today into the new doc, and I'll be posting on LinkedIn once we've got the video all polished up. Awesome. Um, I'll bring up the other doc too, so just to make sure mm -hmm. that we have everything in there. Yes. Yeah, um, I think I think uh, yeah, this is great. Thank you, Matt, because I think that we I added to the previous doc. This yeah, is... it's all good. Um, the only other invite I have is that we, or not invite update I have is that we are doing um, a substation uh, review. Substation is a project that's applied for the CNCF sandbox, but that's just normal news. Um, uh, and last week um, we had our first, uh, well, our first formal uh, leads sync. We, we meet twice on the second and fourth Tuesdays. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, second and fourth Fridays of each month uh, to kind of just have a mostly admin meeting so this one can stay a little more uh, sparky and sparkly. Um, did okay. you already read the disclaimer uh, that we opened the meetings with? We have to? No, I, I don't think I did. Okay. I don't actually read it. I just kind of, <laughs> but uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this is a CNCF sponsored event. As such, the code of conduct that the CFC, CNCF publishes does apply. Uh, please don't do or say anything that would be in violation of that code in chat or the video. Uh, and um, I have an additional, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm on the internet. This is a cat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you might, you, you might cats, see are, cats are everywhere. Yeah, his name is Fred, as in, yeah, Freddie K, I'll say. But with that, um, that's all I have. Um, I wanted to leave room. We have two interesting talks. And so, um, uh, and the meeting is being recorded, right? Yes, yes the MOOC meeting is being recorded. So again, really uh, looking forward to the talk. Yeah, thank um, you so much to our speakers as well. We're very yes, excited. Yes, yes, um, absolutely. It's, it's cool very to have exciting. meaty talks to sink our <laughs> teeth into. So this is awesome. great. Awesome, cool, cool. Thank you. 
Hello, Lita. So over to you, Shilpa. Would you like to introduce yourselves or should I um, actually run through because you did send the bios and uh, happy to run through and introduce uh, you. Please feel free to, Hello, Lita. Okay, okay. Let me do that then. Hi, everyone. Again, very uh, great to see the Cap1 team today joining us in. Um, we have the first talk. Uh, which is by Shilpa, who is the director of engineering at Capon and leads the observability F engineering efforts for OTEL, uh, especially driving the initiative to adopt OTEL across uh, Capon, uh, adopting traces, metrics, logs for different AWS infrastructure and different languages uh, supported for instrumentation. Uh, Shilpa has also had experience in building large-scale uh, distributed systems and end-to-end -end observability for using open source projects. Uh, super happy to also have Bhaskar Banerjee joining in as uh, the Cap1 senior lead staff engineer. Um, and uh, he is currently engaged in supporting enterprise-wide open telemetry practice for Lambdas. So you're a Lambda expert, huh? That's cool. And uh, also comes with previous experience in design, development, and observability of enterprise scale systems. I th uh, today, Shilpa and Bhaskar will be uh, presenting on uh, the work that uh, the Cap1 team has done for open telemetry, uh, especially uh, in terms of telemetry collection for lam la latency sensitive Lambda applications. So this is a very super uh, important topic because many of us, you know, who are using Lambda technologies, especially on cloud providers uh, and AWS specifically, again, there's a lot of tuning that folks end up doing. So um, this is a, a great talk to be had. Um, I will also introduce the second talk, which uh, Alexi uh, will be uh, doing. Uh, and I guess, uh, Alex, uh, you go by Alex Katz. Uh, so Alex is also a software engineer on the Cap1 observability team and has been working on open telemetry, uh, contributing in the open telemetry community. Thank you, Alex. And uh, contributing to various components in the open telemetry repos and components. Um, and Alex will be speaking on uh, the failover connector, which is a, con a component uh, in the for dynamic routing uh, of telemetry data based on downstream exporter health. This is in the collector. Uh, which is a very important part of the open telemetry project, as many of you know. Uh, and it really, this connector provides significant improvement to the data resiliency of the collector uh, so that telemetry data can be continuously exported to a set of stable secondary locations when issues with primary locations are being resolved. So with that said, uh, over to you, Shilpa and Bhaskar, take it away. And then we will be followed by that with a cool talk from Alex. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alavita. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, a bit of introduction about Capital One. I know many of you know, but if at all you do not, um, we are still like a founder-led company, um, though we are 30 years old. And also we are a technology-first organization. Um, and many more stats here. Um, I don't want to bore you all, but um, we are one of the Fortune 100 companies listed um, publicly on New York Stock Exchange. And, um, and also first, second, third, for many thanks here. And also we have um, more than 100 million customers uh, and also 50,000 engineers. Um, wow. So this That's is amazing. something more interesting. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we are open source work. Uh, open source first, and this declaration was made um, by our CEO back in 2014. And uh, we have been uh, making many contributions to the open source community since then. And also we did release um, uh, some of our um, prominent software projects to open source community. We look forward to doing more in the open, open telemetry space. Um, and also we did start our um, open telemetry journey back in 2021. That is when we did some um, spiking and exploratory work, um, did some POCs back then. And we thought this is um, 
um, definitely going to be the future. Um, and um, then in 2022, we identified the use cases and we evaluated to, uh, to see like where hotel is going to be a good fit from an infrastructure language and use case standpoint. Then we took it further in 2023. Um, we did um, integrate into our AMIs and CICD pipelines. And also we, uh, we built additional capabilities to bring parity with our um, vendor tooling that is used internally at this time. Um, I think now we are in 2024. We are um, we are full blown. Um, we are adopting hotel um, across all our cloud native workloads, both server based and also serverless. I wouldn't say we are fully there, but definitely we have the infrastructure um, set up, and um, there is a huge push across the entire enterprise to adopt hotel. So we we are uh, we are here today to um, discuss a couple of topics um, specifically on. Um, how we can effectively use OTEL for um, Lambda applications that have um, time sensitive latency requirements. Um, and Bhaskar um, worked on this big time. I'm going to just introduce a topic, um, talk at a high level and pass it over to um, him who is going to talk in depth and walk us through all of it. Awesome. Um, so initially, yes, yes. We um, Initially, we tried out A dot layer. Um, I know our own Alolita um, was involved in A dot layer, building it from ground up. So I know. I released it. <laughs> so. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> yes. Um, A dot layer is great, um, but at the same time, like if um, we have um, time-sensitive lambdas that have stringent response time requirements, then um, A dot um, did not do extremely well in that case. Um, especially if our um, collector agent is um, hotel collector gateway is like um, either slow or unresponsive. And also a bit of introduction about um, um, the open telemetry architecture, if at all some of you are not familiar with it. Um, let me uh, pick the laser here. So we do have our um, Lambda here to the left. And, um, so with the A dot layer, um, we do have another extension running that has um, a bunch of receivers, processors, and exporters um, customized to our needs. Um, and to the right is the um, gateway collector, hotel collector agent, um, which acts more of a gateway. Um, this is um, scaled to our needs. Basically, we do have multiple deployments of it in different AZs, different regions, automatically scaled. Um, to meet our data needs because we do um, generate like lots of data in the order of like uh, petabytes um, of metrics, logs, and traces. So we want it to be, um, um, have enough capacity to serve our needs. And uh, specifically focus on lambdas. Um, uh, with, with the um, A dot layer, when um, a lambda invocation happens, um, the synchronous call starts here, right? The lambda function generates the telemetry data and sends it over to um, this extension. And the extension um, receives it, puts it in the queue, and then processes it, and then exports it back to the open telemetry collector. This entire thing is synchronous, especially exporting to the collector agent happens fully synchronous um, in the context of Lambda invocation, which means that say if the um, gateway collector is either down or um, slow to respond, in which case the Lambda function is going to be blocked until um, the data is exported to the um, collector. So which was a huge drawback in our case, um, uh, especially for um, the um, time sensitive lambdas. Though it worked for like um, maybe 70% or 80% of the use cases, it didn't um, really address the remaining 30 to 40%. So we wanted to um, try out um, our open telemetry um, hotels a decoupled processor. This looks uh, pretty much similar to what the A dot layer offers, um, except that um, this processor is going to decouple the receiver from the exporter. So soon after the Lambda function um, sends the data, receiver is going to queue it up, and then a processor is going to pick the data from the queue and then put it back in the exporter's um, incoming queue. And immediately the um, Lambda invocation um, response, the uh, Lambda invocation um, completes without waiting for the data to be exported to the collector. Um, and as you see here, the synchronous call starts here and um, it, it ends here. Um, and the um, export of the telemetry data to the collector happens asynchronously, especially in the context of Lambda, which is a huge win. So we are decoupling 
um, the lambda from the collector. So even though the collector is slow or um, unresponsive or whatever happens there, uh, we don't impact the lambda um, service itself, um, except that we incur data loss, um, which is acceptable compared to um, impacting the lambda application itself. Uh, with this, I'm going to pass this over to um, Bhaskar. Thanks, Silpa. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. Am I audible enough? Thank you. Yes, so, that's good. All good. <laughs> I consider this a great privilege. Um, I've been following Liz for a long time. I do hear Liz talks. So when I had this opportunity, I found it a great privilege to present and share our findings on a forum where I, I get to hear my revered speakers. Thank you for this. Uh, the problem we're reading here, uh, it stems from two problems. One, sensitivity to latency, and second, sensitivity to chaos. Um, under normal circumstances where things are going all smooth, everything is green, customers hardly find out there's, there's a problem or, or something to consider. We were also in the same boat until we found out that when system is down, then the upstreams are really complaining. And that's what the scenario was even with ADOT. Needless to say, it is synchronous, so we know the problems with synchronous modes. Highlighted here, um, it blocks the calls. Upstreams, uh, they have failures in case of chaos. And the biggest problem was the potential to block the lambdas beyond timeout was very heavy because the timeouts are not on the export, it's actually on the transport. So when the transport is blocked, then yeah, export, export timeouts don't matter there. So that's where we're trying to figure out what to do. And so if you would go back to the diagram once the, the yes, thank you. So we, uh, we were playing with this, trying to find out what happens here. And uh, we did discover that there's something called decoupled processor. There's also a batch processor there. So we want to uh, went out to AWS that let's find out from them. Um, their answer was they don't want to include the decouple there and they have other reasons. They are on a different roadmap. So that's when we came back saying, okay, then in this case, uh, ADOT has everything packed in as a single layer. We would break it up and build two layers. Why? Firstly, because not everyone is going to use the SDK. SDK is, is pretty much for manual. And, and people who have deeper needs, they are going to use the dependencies, not the SDK right away. So you broke this down. And here we come where we have one synchronous call between the layer and the extension. And then, as Silpa mentioned, that the decouple processor is the one that's going to break the synchronous communication, queue it up, and send it further. So that's what is giving us an edge over latency and an edge over chaos. So beyond this, so we ran some tests. We found out that no matter if the gateway comes back with a retriable error or a non-retriable error, no matter if it's down or if it's up, it does not bother the Lambda. And that was one of the basic needs that we don't want observability to be in the critical path of the application. We being a card, we being a bank, and especially with the cards, we have a lot of sensitive timings as to you know, authorizing transactions, giving out yes or no on frauds. So we can't uh, really bear the burden of latency there. So that's what this piece was doing. Silpa, if you would scroll back, scroll down to the next one. So that was the reason we broke it down two layers and we have jotted it here. Couple of things we did in extra. Uh, still in the previous slide, Silpa. Oh, sure. So a couple of things we did here. So firstly, we found out that retries really don't make a sense unless there is a millisecond blip because our gateways are not gonna go down in a millisecond and come back. Mm -hmm. Disable the retries by default, but we kept them as configurable. So if people really, still think that, hey, data is more important, the observed data is more important than the Lambda, please go ahead, put in numbers and make it configurable, all that is doable. But in a general sense, 
it didn't make much sense from an engineering perspective because if, if a gateway is down or saturated, we know it does take a few minutes or sometimes an intervention to, to make it again back up. So that was one of the things. Second thing was the, the transport timeout. We ran a heavy test on our gateways. By the way, for this, we chose HTTP or gRPC. No, no, nothing wrong with gRPC, but for Lambdas, we found out that just doesn't work best. gRPC is for long-lived connections, and that's not the case with Lambdas. So we switched over to an HTTP gateway, and we specified that uh, for us in Lambda space, we are going to use of, make use of HTTP. And yes, there was a big difference even in the case of response times and cold starts, all those tests. So for this one, what we did, we actually ran a server on a very high TPS, uh, a synthetic load of about 32,000 TPS to remember correctly. And then we ran lambdas at about 4,800, 5,000 TPS to see what happens. So that's about load of 37,000. Because our, 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 our exchange server, uh, the, the API server, uh, hits about 15 billion calls a day. So we were like, if that is what the AP server is receiving, we have to be supporting much more than that. So that's why we were running at very high numbers. And with that, we saw that even um, timeout of less than 70 or let's say under 100 milliseconds is good enough to make 99.9% .9 of the data. Can't quote it because it's de it depends upon the environment but we didn't have a huge error up there. So again, that was a test that we had to conduct to find out what is going to work best for our customers and how much is that we have to look into when we say that we are healthy. So those two things have been kept to bare basics, but are configurable. So teams who want higher delivery or guarantee of service, they can change the transport timeout, it's on them, but we suggest a certain value based upon our what we have found out so far. Further to this, uh, in the next slide, we actually went back to the FAS um, special interest group, the same problem, and they ran a bunch of tests. We ran a bunch of tests. And um, the problem here was, hey, why is the, the collector giving me so much of cold start? What's the reason behind that? And we find out that it is not the collector. <clears throat> It is actually the SDK that's the that's the culprit here. What so, uh, language, uh, Bhaskar? Were you guys using? Node.js, both languages. Node.js and Go. Python. 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 Okay, okay. Because in Go there is nothing called auto instrumentation. It is yes. Here, the dependencies. Absolutely. So, so there are no problems with Go, but with Python and Node.js, uh, we have a, a bunch out there, and because auto instrumentation is so easy to do, people sometimes tend to uh, no, fall prey to it. Yeah, very true. No harm. Uh, I would have done the same thing. But for, for the simple use cases, I think it works fine. <laughs> That's right. For simple use cases where it's a batch or where you don't worry so much uh, how much the upstream is waiting, no worries. But when we have, we have, but teams who have 50 millisecond latency, we, we, they can't afford to wait more than that. So for them, so we, are, we had to run this test to find out where is it, what's blocking it. So then we found out, uh, and they ran the tests, we ran tests, found out that, well, um, if you really want to be fast, we can't have auto instrumentation. So now we are working uh, towards finding out what are the best practices or, or what, are the, what are the guidance to give to teams or manual instrumentation. So that, that will still have the um, the OTIL collector running as an extension so that we can offload it much faster than going to the gateway. But then uh, using auto with using manual instrumentation is going to give us far more um, edge to save our latency costs. So that's what we have found so far. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and see if there are any questions, comments for us. I think I have one question. So you uh, uh, said that um, these uh, changes were, you know, not accepted in a dot, but um, a dot technically just pulls upstream components. So 
uh, you know, I'm assuming that that made it easier for you to just contribute upstream to make some of these changes and maintain, you know, push them into the uh, core code base. Is that is that a correct assumption? Yes, it is correct. But the AWS product manager for a dot yeah documented that did not want the decoupled processor there. So we have regular even meet meetups with them. Mm -hmm. And I clarified with him the same thing. So he also said that yes, they don't want the decouple there. Um, and it's it's not to do with the decoupled processor as is, but it's because their roadmap of dealing with this is a little different. So AWS is considering um, a totally different setup outside of the open telemetry collector. I see, also, because yeah. um, I think the changes mostly, you know, and for and this is for anybody using Otel, um, is that, well, ADOT also, you know, had the assumption that uh, the changes should be pushed upstream into the project itself. And then those uh, improvements can be inherited from, a, you know, into ADOT through the collector and the um, other libraries, right? Right, right. We went actually looking in the same direction. Um, I mean, we didn't even consider writing our own piece earlier. And um, we found out there's a lot of question answer going on. Yes. On, on the A dot repos itself saying, these are the issues, what is to be done? And here are the comments saying, no, we don't want decouple. So that's why we couldn't push it up. Otherwise, that would have been far easier for us to do. Yes, th that is true. Yeah. I mean, again, I think there are reasons as to why, but um, it's also that it's it's great that you you know made the effort to actually push it to open telemetry because I think it has a um, first of all a lot lot deeper impact in terms of you know for any of the use cases because the latency uh, with lambda applications is a very well known um, or well. Uh, you know, seen uh, scenario for many, many Lambda users, right? So uh, this is super helpful. Yeah, I did. I did just want to add, I think we have actually found that even outside of the decouple processor, there's a good amount of parity um, in the component list that's included in the A dot distribution, especially the one that's in the Lambda layer. Yeah. Uh, and the open source repo. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's rather significant. Um, so it seems like they're almost just maintaining kind of an intended component set. So yes, yes. I mean, it's again the objective of A dot really was to create a uh, tuned subset, if you will, exactly. of components. Yeah. But you know, again, contribute changes upstream to the project mm -hmm. itself. Yeah, I think uh, going back to your earlier question, um, Alolita, like um, I think it it wasn't much difficult for us to um, even though A dot did not accept it it wasn't way too difficult because um, it is all available in open source, right? Open yes, telemetry yes. And uh, ADOT is based on hotel layers anyways. Correct. I think the only difference is that they had, um, ADOT has both the agent and the SDK combined into one single layer. Whereas with the layers that we customized, um, um, Baskar broke it down into two separate layers, uh, one for SDK, because um, we can leave it up to the teams to decide whether they want to auto instrument or uh, manually instrument, depending on their use cases. And the extension layer has only the collector agent here. But it's it's very, um, because the open source has it, so it was, um, it was pretty So nice. is this extension layer, again, I'm just trying to understand, still sitting in the SDK repos, or is it um, sitting in the collector repos or elsewhere? It's actually in the open source, open telemetries collector uh, repo. So Collector have... repo, okay. So in the extensions folder. Uh, no, in the open telemetry collector folder. Okay. Okay. It's the link here. If you want to take a look. Um, they have Awesome. This is really good because I think this is super, it's actually a better architecture, I would say. But right. then I just want to call out that with the decoupled processor, we found out that the cold start is sometimes more or, or many times it is impact because it also needs to start and it's an extension. So, we're adding one more extension to whatever we have today, and that adds the code stat. The reason this saves us is primarily because the offload is localized and because of chaos. Mm -hmm. So that's when this saves the most. But otherwise, 
in terms of gold stars yes there is an additional penalty teams have to pay it's not huge but there is some needless to say and that's where we are going after teams to say that um, if this is what you cannot bear then you'll have to set up the provision concurrency so that you can you know, take care of this in a longer run this this proves better mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, sp speed is of like Baskar mentioned. The speed is of utmost importance to us. Totally. To yep. Starts which we can yep. mitigate through um, provision concurrency. Mm -hmm. So we took this route. Yeah, Matt, you had a question. Matt, I think. It seems frozen. I think it's frozen. <laughs> Ritesh, did you want to go next? <laughs> Matt can come. We can come back to it. Great presentation, Silpa and uh, Baskar. So one question I had was, um, Baskar, on your table, so I'm from what I understand, manual instrumentation with a decoupled processor is the fastest. Is that how I should be reading it? Like that's the lowest latency? That is right. It is not the lowest cold start, right. but the lowest latency. Yes. Got yeah, it. The bottom most is the best. I think that's what uh, Baskar noted. They're decreasing duration. I think the top one is has the highest latency. As you go down, it reduces. Got it. Okay. Um, good. Good to know. Okay. Great. Sorry for the connection blip. I moved my phone from up here to down there. Um, uh, did you have much pushback from development teams around the the developer experience of, you know, having having these two different options, and and was it hard for teams to understand? You know, did it require like a, a team by team walk through your organization or was it more like you could publish a fact and people could sort of sort it out? I know many organizations try to stay away from having like a debug build where everything works and you know, the release build that is chaos and confusing. So was that was that a challenge organizationally? Sometimes those non-technical deployment challenges across teams can can be far can, can be more difficult than one, one anticipates. Yes, we did have that and we're still going through that. I need to say okay. This is where I One approach came up. Why didn't you put all the call to logs and, and read asynchronously? We even tried that. Mm. Uh, what's happening there is we found out that the console exporter is not standard. Every language mm. console exporter can behave differently. And it calls out clearly in the logs in, in the document saying, hey, don't use log, exp log exporter for the production. You went back saying, okay, now if I do it a synchronous way, then I have to write my own serializer and deserializer. Yeah, That's and that. and logging the log uh, exporter is actually used for debugging primarily in the hotel collector. So you really you know cannot guarantee latency related you know solutions through it. Latency of the lambda might go away, but right. now I don't know what's happening to the data. <laughs> so yeah, yeah is there? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I was just gonna say briefly later on if there are any other things that come to mind. Um, we get a, I get asked a lot sometimes about you know usually in a in a one on one Slack or something, <laughs> you know like hey what about these organizational kind of people things you know are there any tips you have on on how to sell, you know how to sell this or well, that. The, um, the biggest you know. selling point is the uh, fending the chaos. Everyone understands that no system is proof to a zero downtime, and um, the tests prove that in case of chaos they would be saved. So although this may not be the, the, the best in terms of latency, they could have, I mean, do, they may do much more, but what happens when that, that case is what is a huge selling point. And there are still things that we got to you know, fend, for, fend even on, on this side. Uh, we are still going through it, Matt. Yeah, there's a good case study in how sometimes dashboards can be counterproductive, you know, if all they're looking at is latency per team, like a leaderboard, right? You have these uh, weird cycles. Thank you for taking Yeah, you, you bring up a good question, Matt. Um, so indeed, like we wanted to make the easy path the right path. So we, we wanted to give them the solution out of the box, but that is where the challenge is, right? The use cases are so diverse that um, teams will need to fine tune them. For example, one team doesn't want any retries, right? because um, losing telemetry data is acceptable for them, but not they don't want to risk losing their applications being down or going slow, whereas other teams are the other way. So fine-tuning it to each team's use cases is like um, definitely brought unique challenges. So our best practices are geared towards like different use cases and um, which, which made it difficult to make it easy for all teams to adopt in one go. So teams had to like pilot 
for their use cases in um, QA environment to make sure that it meets their needs. Tune it, write, and then take it to prod. We were still going through the journey, um, but things are very complex with um, satisfying the Lambda users. Thanks. Alex, you have your hand up. Yeah, I actually, I just want to ask a quick clarifying question just about so what um what impact were we seeing on on the cold starts when using the couple processor like a significant one or about to pull up the correct numbers. Um, what I remember, it was negligible in the order of like few tens of milliseconds, right, Baskar? Mm, okay. uh, it is. Uh, roughly about 120 at max that we are seeing. Mm. Interesting. Add yeah. some. But the biggest yeah. comes from enabling the SDK is the biggest factor, even not just mm. adding. Yeah, because I, I would assume that enabling the decouple processor should be fairly minimal. Just it's essentially just spinning up a, a Go routine, right? Like That's a right. Go routine. Right. So, so. See, we just ran one set of tests. If I would do this recurrently, I'm sure I'll find a very, mm. very but just few right. runs in average of 120. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it varies uh, significantly again, you know, with so many calls that you're handling. Um, again, depends on the spikes and the ebbs coming in. And the Lambda is where the infrastructure is not in the control. Yeah. Uh, we just don't know if, if this is the best one or I'm going to get an M5 or a CXI. Exactly. It is so much weird there. I mean, it, uh, it also, I think, depends on, you know, the kind of instances you're using um, and, you know, what's available, right? So latency is dependent on many, many different layers. Yeah, but that's one level of obfuscation we have. We just do not know. Wow. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Hey, Bhaskar, uh, I have one question around the SDK enablement. Was that part of like the Lambda function constructor initialization or post like the function is initialized? This happens uh, when the runtime, uh, after the runtime is initialized. Okay. And so uh, in that case, will it impact code start? Because code start is usually the function constructor call. When you say function constructor, help me again. So yeah, I'm talking. So like yeah. Lambda has this two uh, call, like init and invoke. Init is where your function is initialized, and invoke is where your first customer request comes. Okay. So even the init is broken down. If you look at the API lifecycle mm -hmm. of the extensions, yeah. uh, you would see that first it is the extension that is initialized. Mm -hmm. Once that's done, the extension calls back the runtime. And then the runtime initialization happens. And after that, the Lambda code is initialized. So in it is in three parts. In it is not one block, it is three different blocks. And once all of this has completed, that's when the invoke can happen. So if you see here, that's what is happening. The, the, the constructor or, or the first call is what you see is the execute handler. But before that, the, the init is for, I can share the link with you uh, just in case you want. You will see that the life cycle of the. Um... Yeah, I think I have this uh, documentation. Uh, I was more wondering, like, if this can be moved to the invoke part, like, is like can be part of outside of the layer, and can then SDK just be enabled as part of the invocation path? Well, that would be a change in the upstream in the open source code. If at all, hmm. I mean, I, I don't, I don't. Would that really be possible though? So, because the way that like the auto instrumentation typically works, right, for like Python is, I, I think it essentially looks into like your dependencies, like your pip packages, and will determine like which auto instrumentation to inject. Um, I don't know if, how exactly that would work if we had to move that up to the invoke stage, right? Because you typically all all of those things are done during initialization. Um, A callback can work, there, Alex. Typically, callbacks work in every function, every language. A callback can mm -hmm. be, but that that would need a change in how open telemetry code is written today. The collector. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just also thinking, just since it's not, um, 
So because of what you might also end up with there, that it's essentially the Lambda signal that it's ready to be invoked, right? But the auto instrumentation didn't load. So then at that point, you're also opening the door to get for right. transactions that are not instrumented. Right, so, right. That's yeah. the, the change yeah. is today uh, the, so the way, it, if you look at it, it calls the next API mm -hmm. on the, and that would need a change on when the next API has to be called so that it knows registration is complete, extension is ready. So that ready piece, the definition of the ready would change if I do that. In essence, I'm just moving a piece of work from the ready piece to the post ready piece. And and that's not, I mean, it's a change of the premise. The premise is my extension is ready, whereas it is not. Yeah, it's hard to retrofit like a lazy start or something or a lazy load like that with, mm -hmm. in, a, in a clean way for sure. And did you guys consider the provision concurrency to be helpful, like to just move all this part for yes. the warm container? Yes, but call out. Once you're out of that, you again hit a cold start. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's spillover over uh, invocation. I mean, definitely. that's that's the, it's a pro and a con of the Lambda implementation fundamentally. And also to, to one of your uh, question that you were saying, like, we really, uh, like Lambda is a black box uh, to be specific, yes, but uh, the way we define the memory and the duration, that is how Lambda allocate the CPU uh, to which machine it, it will put your functions like the larger machine or the smaller machine. So yep. let's say if you add a couple of more memories and CPU, it's just give you a little bigger machine. So you get more boosted CPU uh, and cold start may come down. But Again, then you pay the price for that extra memory and CPU, and if you're not really using it, it's not worth saving a 10 millisecond of extra latency. Right, we tested all of this at 256 MB. We didn't feel any, we were testing bare bone lambdas, but I'm sure when our customers run their heavy metal stuff, we'll have to advise them to do so, so that they, and in fact, they would have to do that even if they did not use open telemetry just for their own stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, like I originally worked at AWS, like Lambda, and one of the, we built a service on top of Lambda, like uh, at the very first service within AWS. And we were seeing like 29 seconds of P100 cold start latency. We built mm -hmm. the entire control plane. Mm -hmm. And it took, uh, it took me almost like 11 months to run a project. And we get it down to like 700 milliseconds. Uh, but it was in three different phases. Uh, and again, there are a lot of things we have to add to the Lambda and then we, and it was more actually more less on the Lambda side and more on the Lambda user side, like how you efficiently use your Lambda, which is all this. I think back then there was no provision concurrency. There was no like snap start and nothing in 2018 around. So even then we got it down from 29 second to 700 millisecond. I think today there are a lot more things to, it can be further optimized. But yeah, I mean, uh, even within sitting within inside AWS, we were calling like, oh, Lambda is a black box. We don't really know how to fix the, uh, like all the knobs. So we used to go and sit down with the Lambda folks to understand their architecture and see how we can make this thing better. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right, Mohit. Even by adopting this decoupled processor, we are not going to solve all the use cases. There are going to be some teams where this is just not going to work for them, right? So, yeah. This is something like uh, we are going to help yeah. solve. Use yeah, cases. absolutely. Yeah. And and also, Shilpa, to your point, I think, uh, Mohit, again, it, it's, uh, I mean, Lambda has so many different scenarios, right? So it's, I think, uh, you have to kind of have it purpose built literally to solve different kinds of uh, use cases. But um, that said, again, I'm going to uh, just call time here because I do want to get Alex to come in, uh, you know, present. Uh, we have about 15 minutes, uh, you know, that we can uh, take it to 10. So, Alex, uh, it's your floor. Go for it. <laughs> yep. Thank you would you much. like to share or would you like um, me to do this? I think this is fine. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. So I guess just to give a kind of pre overview overview. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about the failover connector. Um, it's a, a new component uh, that we kind of worked on at the beginning start of this year, uh, recently made its way into alpha. So kind of one outcome that I'm hoping as I socialize it is that more teams will use it. 
you know, that usage will kind of point to probably, you know, bugs, some kind of performance considerations. And then from there, we can kind of consistently improve it. So my takeaway from this talk, and I'm actually going to be presenting a similar kind of vari variation of this at KubeCon, is that teams use it. And then from there, we can continuously improve it. So that being said, we can get started. Um, so for the current state of um, auto collector resiliency, so the collector is meant to be kind of like a high throughput data pipeline. It's not really built for kind of persistence, right? So right now the data resiliency of the collector is handled exclusively by the exporters. <clears throat> There's, um, you know, through like queuing and through like the retry configurations. Um, it's more so kind of built for rate limiting and like throttling, uh, but there is also persistent queue um, that is kind of or I guess the pure use case of resiliency, but then it, uh, the obvious problem with that is that, you know, with a, with a high enough throughput within like a single minute of downtime, if you're relying on the persistent queue, you can generate gigabytes, if not, you know, on a larger gateway, potentially pushing terabytes of data within a small amount of time. So while it's good for kind of very specific, probably lower throughput, lower DPS use cases, it's not really a good kind of enterprise-wide solution, right? So kind of the the sad reality of the collector is that no matter as resilient as you make it the collector is only going to be as resilient as the next target in the export chain so um yep next slide please so enter connectors um so for just to give kind of a brief overview of what connectors are connectors are essentially just a way to export telemetry data between pipelines within the same collector right so if you look here at this diagram you can, this will be, let's say, tra you know, traces, and then the second one will be traces one. You can get all the way through to the export, export a part of traces one, and then essentially have data routed back to traces two. So the blue part in the middle there is actually the actual connector. And by modifying the logic, um, essentially connectors give you a way to kind of like modify, to structure logic in a way for when you want to reroute data to a different pipeline. Um, so common other <clears throat> use cases for connectors are things like routing, right? There's a routing connector. So let's say you want to route based on um, if the data has this attribute route to this pipeline, if the data has this attribute route to this pipeline, to that pipeline and so on. Um, another one is the count connector, for example. Um, for the count connector, it's if you want to create a metric for the number of spans that are coming through your traces pipeline, it can essentially directly connect to the metrics pipeline of your collector and generate a metric um, as, you know, essentially spitting out a count for how many spans have come through. So this use case of connectors um, kind of lends itself pretty naturally to the concept of like a failover connector, right? So uh, if we go to the next slide, please. So the failover connector. Um, pretty pretty intuitive, I guess, what, it, what essentially how it works, right? So you essentially have a list of priority, like a uh, priority pipelines. And then as each one goes unhealthy, you would essentially fail over to the next priority pipeline, right? So in this example here, let's say we have two unhealthy pipelines. Then in this case, the third one that happened to be healthy, that's the one that all traffic is going to be funneled through. Um, so again, kind of the main idea behind this is that if you have kind of, let's say, Let's say if you're before before the failover connector, you were kind of locked into each pipeline being stuck with like a target, like a, a target endpoint that it was going to be exporting to. So if you wanted to do failover, you have to do it on the infrastructure level. Like let's say your um, you know, your service was down, you actually have to fail over the the endpoint itself, maybe update the C name to now point to a different uh to like your actual, let's say your passive uh infrastructure in a different region and so on. And obviously with you know TTLs and whatnot, there's actual downtime there. Um, with the failover connector, that can be done instantaneously. As you fail over to a new pipeline, assuming that infrastructure is up, within a, within you know a certain number of milliseconds, you're now exporting data to a stable stream. Um, next next slide, please. Um, yeah, so to go over the, some of the specifics, um, so it supports traces, metrics, and logs, so all of the major open telemetry signals, um, and it's driven by backwards propagated error. So, uh, so can we actually go back to the previous, just so I can demonstrate something. Um, so the idea for what will actually trigger the failover is if, let's say at this top priority level, um, if any of the components within that pipeline return an error and propagate that error backwards, that error will essentially terminate at the, at the failover connector level. 
and the failover connector will then switch over the pipeline to the next priority pipeline and so on. The only time that the failover connector will propagate an error backwards towards like the top, uh, towards like the, uh, I wish I could point here, but towards like the pipeline that actually has the exporter part of the connector is if essentially you, you run out of pipelines to export to. If let's say you have these three pipelines here and they're all unhealthy, at that point, the failover connector will export, will propagate the error back towards the true receiver in this pipeline. Um, um, yeah, I think we go back to that slide. So another kind of, I think, awesome part of this is that it's not tied to any specific component, right? So when we originally were kind of thinking about, like I, there were there were kind of some discussions in the open source community of like, uh, how can we do failover to second door, secondary exporters? But all of that was kind of within the scope of, you know, a single exporter, let's say within the OTLP um, exporter, you wanted a secondary pipeline, a secondary exporter destination in case your primary went down. Um, but that obviously would be very tightly coupled with the component itself. And then every single component would have to essentially adopt a similar structure. The idea here is that this can work across all signal types and all components. As long as the two signal types are compatible, you can put a failover connector between them. Between any, you know, yeah, any traces to traces, any metrics to metrics pipeline, they're compatible with the, with the failover connector as long as they're propagating errors. Um, that's kind of the one requirement. As long as they can receive a signal that an error occurred downstream in your pipeline, the failover connector is applicable. Um, so yeah, again, going over kind of the concept of the priority list. Um, yeah, that the you can essentially pass a boundless priority list with as many um, kind of target downstream exporters as you want or downstream pipelines as you want. Um, and it has a configurable retry mechanism that we'll go over here in the next slide. Um, so to, I guess, quickly go over the example config. Um, so there we have the three priority levels. So essentially here we have three levels. We have uh, in the first one, traces first and traces also first. So it will work in a fan out uh, mechanism, right? So if you have two, um, two pipelines within a single level, uh, it will do a fan out, but if either one of those pipelines go unhealthy, then that entire level is deemed to be unstable and it will fail over to the next stable pipeline. So then I did briefly just want to go over kind of the retry mechanism and show kind of how the retry flow works. So let's say, uh, just going off that example there, let's say you're currently uh, on the right side, your current stable levels is traces fourth. So the start of every retry interval, uh, which is a config configurable option here in this case will be two minutes. So every two minutes, uh, this flow will start. So it'll first attempt to reestablish traces first, since that's the top, the top priority pipeline. Uh, and let's say that fails. At that point, it immediately fails over back to traces fourth, which is a stable pipeline. And it'll wait the retry gap, in this case, 15 seconds before it tries again to the for the next stable pipeline. So at that point, 15 seconds passes, uh, trace a second is tried, and trace a second also fails. So at that point, again, immediately, it falls back over to traces fourth, and will again wait that 15 second retry gap before trying traces third. So then let's say traces third is healthy, then at that point, this uh, retry interval cycle is terminated and it'll wait two more minutes before it now restarts retrying between traces first and traces third. So all the way up until traces first comes back as healthy, it'll keep on trying every two minutes to uh, essentially establish uh, a connection on the top priority pipeline, um, all the way up until uh, the max retries per pipeline are consumed. So in this case, it's 10. 10 is probably a bit low realistically, but um, and you can disable max retries altogether if you wanted to essentially continue on endlessly. Um, so yeah, after that, like I said, after two minutes, it would try to, and even though the current stable pipeline is traces third, um, it'll continue trying to retry all the way up to traces first. Um, yep, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so just to go over some kind of potential use cases, probably the most simple one is right if you just have let's say, uh, active passive or active active, um, you know, setup, um, and you're just trying to fail over from your unstable region to a stable region. So let's say your east is down. Now you can configure your pipeline to export directly to west. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another one is, let's say you want to buy, like, uh, so if, let's say your downstream is, if you're getting an error from an exporter, that typically means that your next kind of hub your next export in your export chain is down. So then one thing that you can do is essentially configure as a kind of a, a last resort to bypass your um, the next hop 
in the export chain, right? So let's say it's if you're using kind of like the hub and spoke model, your agents are supposed to export to a gateway. Let's say the gateway is down. To, for users, the one thing that's important is to not really lose data at their true, like in the true observability backend, right? So like you might lose out on some benefits of some some of the things that the gateway is doing, like, you know, batching to reduce kind of the, you know, the number of requests or some potential data enhancements, but you can essentially ensure that you're going to, your data will make its way to the observability backend. Um, so that obviously will be pretty significant for reducing data loss. Um, yep, next slide, please. And uh, a good one is also for a high uptime target, right? So let's say again, your gateway is down. One thing that you can do is, you know, you know, S3 has probably what, like a 99.99% .99 availability, probably even higher. I don't know how many nines. So you can, as a last, as a last resort, again, just export to S3 or something like, like Kinesis or something that, you know, you won't have to worry about the resiliency of, and then, you know, all of your data is kind of retained there. And then once your gate, you know, once you've resolved the issue with your actual gateway, it'll recover. And then you can kind of, you know, asynchronously do some sort of streaming mechanism to get that data back to your observ observability backend. Um, so the, the key part to remember here and the key kind of outcome of this is that at the end of the day, um, none of the data is lost. So right now, without this mechanism, downtime of the downstream equals data lost. There's no way around it. But through any of these three approaches, that essentially goes out the door. So that's the that's the main benefit there. Um, yep, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so for upcoming enhancements, so things that are kind of coming down the pipeline. So one thing that became kind of clear that we need is we need a failover count metric, right? Um, all of this is great, but if you don't know how many times um, your pipeline failed over, what, what are you really going to do with that info, right? So you, you you need kind of some sort of, I think I would actually argue that's a very critical metric for kind of measuring your own system health, right? And based off these metrics, you can probably make some sort of, it'll probably trigger some sort of, you know, adjustment needed downstream for kind of, you know, the, the health of your gateway or the resiliency of your gateway. So I think that will be a very critical and very helpful piece. Uh, and then a secondary one is queuing in the connector. So this was brought up to us by um, by a few teams at this point. So the idea is that um, the exporters, so again, the thing that'll trigger, trigger uh, failover is uh, backwards propagated errors. So in the case of an, a queue existing on the exporter, um, that queue, th that exporter is only going to return an error if the queue is full. Right. So at that point, um, you know, if your your actual um your actual true target destination might be down, but until that queue is full, it's all data is being funneled through there. And with some sort of and the queue I think dumps, I think by default after like five minutes, or there's some sort of um setting there, you can essentially still introduce data loss. Um, because if like your queue is being, you know, if the the stuff and you if the data in your queue is essentially expiring before it's before the recovery, then data is again being dropped. So the idea here is if we do the queuing directly, so one more thing, but what this led to is that a lot of teams started disabling the queue for kind of immediate failover. So if we could enable the queuing directly in the connector, then we essentially resolve this issue, right? We still have like the ability to do asynchronous exports, configurable retries and whatnot, um, but we would, essentially do them directly in the queue um, that, that's built into the connector itself. So those are two things that are kind of in the works. Um, uh, yeah, and we that we think will also kind of increase the or improve the user experience. So um, I think that's about it. Sorry that I, I went kind of quickly. I know that we were somewhat low on time. So um, yep, I think that's about it. <laughs> no worries, Alex, right on time. So yeah. thank you. This is a good very good overview and again you know uh, you're absolutely welcome once you've done your kubecon ta talk to come back and you know do a follow up um because i i think you know one of the great things about the tag uh, discussions is that we typically you know also can invite uh, open telemetry maintainers as well as others that you know you would you've been working with and could actually have a more deep dive of a discussion on specific areas but sometimes it's hard in the sig meetings because you know there are so many different topics lined up 
So um, again, uh, looking forward to your KubeCon talk also. On this. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> I have all kinds of questions, but we don't have time. But uh, <laughs> one that maybe I'll watch in, in KubeCon if it comes up is I'm kind of curious how how these mechanisms play well with you know network instability or sporadically unavailable networks that that could trigger retries, but then the network's just back just long enough to trigger a uh, rather a failover, not a retry, um, and, and things like that, right? Um, you know, when you have like chaos ensuing, um, yeah, it, it occurs to yeah. me too that it would be really interesting to hook up this whole setup to an instance of, um, there's a project called Litmus that is presented to the tag a few years ago that is all about randomly breaking network connections within a cluster if this is all hosted. Uh, so you can kind of... I think, I think Matt, you're clipping again. You might want to turn off your video. This is Matt's flaky connection. There's a chaos happen. So, um, oh, it's okay. We're, we're, I'm not sure if any of that came through at all. Um, so uh, I'll go away with my bad I think, I think you love to, to repeat your yourself. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, I, I was just saying, um, uh, you know, oftentimes when chaos is happening, uh, it can be really, really hard as an operational team, right? Because you, you just have these individual reports, but there's a, there's a project in the CNCF uh, called Litmus uh, that's all about replicating these chaos scenarios in different flavors in different ways. And so it would be interesting to see um, as like a set of negative tests, like how this new, how these new failover mechanisms play well with network instability mm -hmm. that's sporadic or random, right? Um, but this is a great, these are both great talks. Thank you so much for, for coming to the tag. We're, we're thrilled to host. And, and as Alalita said, um, uh, come back when, uh, if they, when, when, when we learn more. Uh, yeah, to totally. That. And, you know, again, I think, uh, Matt, to your point, KubeCon is just around the corner. It's about less than a month away. So um, we will be having another tag session before that, uh, right before KubeCon, because typically, you know, our tag meetings are on the first and the third week of every uh, every month. So um, again, you know, if you're interested in diving onto specific areas or even inviting, you know, you want us to invite any of the um, maintainers from the projects, again, happy to um, pull a session together. So um, really appreciate uh, Alex, uh, Bhaskar, and Shopa joining in today. Mohit, thank you for joining in. Again, I know you guys have done some amazing work. Um, uh, and and looking forward to having you back on the tag meetings again. Awesome. Uh, but have a wonderful day. And and again, uh, we'll regroup uh, in the first week of November. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Take care. Bye.